I feel honored to be here with you today on this special day, and I thank you very much, Brad, for that introduction. We started together 26 years ago. How about that? And we're still pretty close together, huh? <laughs> Amen. It is an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. God is merciful and gracious. And uh, if not for Christian education, you would have somebody different here today. I'm here because of how God has blessed in my life. And uh, it's my little commercial that if you uh, are thinking, if God is leading for something to happen, for you to develop your, your, your occupation more, I want you to know that Southwestern Adventist University is nearby. But even if you can't come to classes every day, we have a distance ed program. Amen. And you can still continue to do what you're doing and can complete uh, what you need to do for your occupation. But I hope too, that just as these young people are learning, it's not just your occupation, but it's your vocation, right? It's how you live for Jesus where you live. And Southwestern Adventist University exists for one reason, you do. God has placed us there for that reason, to uh, guide and direct you and what you're doing and the young people that he entrusts to us, these young teachers that are graduating. And Eddie will be holding meetings here next month in your church. Thank you so much for being a part of our campus and extending that opportunity to these young people. So I encourage you, if God is impressing upon your heart or a grandchild of yours or a son or a daughter, Please, Southwestern Adventist University is there to be of service to you. You saw all these young people lined up here today. Did you really? Uh, did you really? I don't know. Did, uh, did you see a, a Mrs. Reed up here? I think maybe there was one. Did you see a Mr. Simmons and a Mrs. Simmons? I, I, I think I... Did you see some of them up here? I, did anybody see a Pastor Charles? And, and uh, did you see them up in his wife? And did you see them up here? Anybody see Carlos Craig? <laughs> Larry Moore? Ted Wilson? Anybody see Gifted Hands? Ben Carson up here today? Did you see Whitney Phipps in music? I, I don't know. I, I see the McHenry sitting out here. Did you see other... Doctors in biology standing right up here. My replacement. Right here. <laughs> yes, they're here, aren't they? We know them by name and we see them in class, but we don't know what God has planned for them and what they will do. Your deacons and elders, they're here. They're here. And little do we know how God is going to use these young people. And most importantly, and I don't know how heaven's going to work. I got ideas. But I tend to think there's going to be some kind of alumni something in heaven, right? There's people that are going to remember doing things with people. And maybe there will be a, an alumni. A group like this that sings and says, Jesus, let us sing this for you face to face. We sang it before when we were in that elementary school. And we're here. Because of this church, we want to sing it, Lord, to you as a tribute for the people who made it possible for us to be. Did you see these people up here today? I'm from West Virginia. And in 1985, there was a, a book that was required reading. It was simply called Jaeger. <laughs> it was an autobiography of this World War II pilot who was decorated, and on October 14, 1947, he flew the, he flew the X-1 research rocket, and he broke the sound barrier, went over 700 miles an hour. Became a test pilot. He's from West Virginia. <laughs> His book was required reading. And in 1953, they were testing the Super Saver F-100 rocket. It would carry over 800 pounds of of bombs that traveled 1,600 miles an hour. But several pilots had been killed in the testing. Uh, they very much wanted this rocket, but it had proved to be very deadly. And so Chuck Yeager 
took it on himself to find out the problem. And he took this plane up. And uh, he knew that it had crashed on landing twice. He'd come in and they'd lost two pilots. And so he took it up to 30,000 feet and said he started going through the landing procedure at 30,000 feet. And when he got to one spot, he said it just like the, the bottom dropped out and it fell. He said at about 10,000 feet, he was able to control it again and bring it back up. And he did the same thing. Took it through the landing procedure and at one spot, the bottom just dropped out and fell. He knew he had a problem. He had to land this thing. And when he came back down to land, he figured out a way to sort of bypass that one step, though it came in not the way it's supposed to land, but he got it on the ground. And as they began to analyze, they were able to take that plane apart. And they were able to trace to the assembly plant that put it together, and not just the plant, but to the assembly line. And not just the assembly line, but to the person on that line. You see, there was a part in the wing of that plane, uh, in the aerial part that the f allowed the flaps to come down when it landed, and there was a bolt there that the instructions said that the head of the bolt was to be here and the bolt was to be up here, the, the nut on that bolt. But it didn't look right that way. And so the person on the assembly line had turned it upside down and put the nut on the bottom. I want to suggest to you, as our sermon title says today, the big doors swing on small hinges. Do you believe that? They're just a small, insignificant thing, seemingly, that a person does. And it looks right in their eyes. It could cause all kinds of destruction and heartache and pain. Big doors swing on small hinges. And that's where we want to look today in the Word of God, because I really believe that. I think that one person can make a difference. Do you believe that today? In this world, one person can make a difference. I would like for you to open your Bibles with me to our scripture reading. To 2 Kings chapter 5. I want you to notice somebody here with me if you would. This person, this one life that made a difference. You see, one moment, this young lady is in a small village in North Israel. The next moment, she finds herself in the commerce and traffic of Damascus, Syria. One moment, she is working side by side, close with her family and friends. The next moment, she's with a marauding group of, of soldiers taken captive. One moment she has a name, she's a daughter, she's a granddaughter, she's a niece. The next moment, she's a nameless slave. You see, this young life has changed significantly. Not because of anything that she did. You see, Israel was at peace. There was a treaty, Ben Haddad, the... Uh, the, the, the ruler there in Syria had a, a peace treaty. This was a border skirmish. This young girl was taken family, uh, taken captive. We don't know what happened to her family. We can assume the, the worst. They're never mentioned again. You ever wonder why some things happen to some people, not others? Wouldn't it be easy with this young girl to think, why me? This is not a time of war. It's a time of peace. This is sort of an indiscriminate act of violence. And she's caught in it. And she finds herself in a very difficult situation. I want to suggest that life for her had probably no joy or even hope for change. And because of no fault of her own, she had every reason to become angry and bitter and defiant. Scott Peck wrote a book once entitled The Road Less Traveled. 
And uh, he's a, a psychiatrist. And I memorized the opening line of that book. The opening line, first line, road less travel. Life is difficult. And in the rest of his book, he said, this book is about people who will not accept that premise that life is difficult. It's not fair. Life's not fair. Bad things happen to people who don't deserve it. Have you ever noticed that? Life's not fair. And sometimes we're all caught up in that. We are the recipients of that unfair life. I want to tell you something. I don't want you throwing hymn books at me. But I don't think God is fair. He is merciful, he's just, he's long-suffering, he's kind. But Psalms 103 says, he understands our frame and knows that we are but dust. God does not treat us as we deserve. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. If it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we'd all be blind and eating baby food. Do you know that? <laughs> if we got what we deserved, we would be in serious trouble. And I'm so glad in this world that is sometimes unfair. God knows how to deal with that. With things that happen to people. That happen to this little girl. That's not fair. But I can't help but think that maybe the joy in her life could have been when she heard sobs coming from her master's room. For you see, what started as a spot became a blotch and then became an open sore. And this commander of the army, Nahum, respected by the king, admired by the people, a valiant soldier, he has leprosy now. He had become a leper. I, I don't know much about leprosy. You don't hear a lot about that today. I, I read some material in Philip Yancey's book, Disappointed with God, where he interviews Dr. Paul Bland, who opened the only leprosy hospital in the United States. He had been a missionary overseas, and he was interested in studying this disease here, to how he could help there. And, and in his book, it talked about how disfiguring and torturous leprosy was. It attacks the appendages. It destroys the nerve endings. Not just in your hands, but even your face. Your nose disappear, your ears. And he, the Dr. Bland said he never could figure out in India what would happen to people's hands as they, they would begin disappearing. The fingers, the appendages. And he discovered later it was the rats that came out at night that ate these appendages and the people felt no pain. It was serious. He, he developed a little way of putting electrodes under the arms and extending them down. And it gave sensation here when something was hot or there was pressure. You felt it somewhere else because you lost the use of, of your senses. This idea of leprosy was serious in the times of Jesus. You see, a leper would be driven from his home and his family, his position. And he would be forced to take up residence with the death and the dying. And I want to suggest something to you today. It is the perfect disease that you wish on your worst enemy, right? See, if I'd been that little girl, I'd been tempted to think, you mess with me, God will get you, right? You destroyed my home. Can you hear all the pain and the agony? And she saw the tears probably of the family members of Naaman. She was in their home. That would be my consolation. <laughs> But that's not what scriptures say. You see, it's easy to feel that way about those who hurt you or betray you. You see them go through a s small agony that grows into life-changing pain. I want you to see something, and I know we're talking about education today. We're just about there. Watch this. I want to suggest it was a miracle. It was a miracle. And the miracle is not that Naaman dipped himself in the muddy Jordan River seven times. That was a miracle. The Bible says his flesh uh, was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Naaman even said there's no God like the God of Israel. 
What a witness to go back to his heathen nation of the true God. But I want to suggest something to you today. That that miracle would have not happened if not for the miracle in the life of that little girl. We don't even know her name. I just choose to call her what Uncle Arthur calls her in his bedtime stories. Little maid. <laughs> we don't even know her name. But I want you to see in this answer, if you would, with me. I want you to see that I wish it had been possible to meet her parents. How do you train a young person? Not knowing what the future holds. But how do you train them in such a way that when they're not in your home, when life has taken a turn different than you planned, I want you to notice something about this young lady. And I think, Mrs. Reed, it is the keys to Christian education. I want us to see some characteristics of this young lady in the midst of her private pain. I want you to see what emerges. Would you open your Bibles with me? You're there in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. And look what she says in verse 3. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I, I, I'm overwhelmed by that statement for three reasons. I think that there's three principles that show me that this young lady had a, had a biblical influence in her life. I know through her parents. I don't know what type of education she had, but I know what's possible today that can give you these same kinds of views of life. Would you notice the first thing she does? In the midst of what's happening in her life, somehow it's been instilled in her she believes that God still exists. Isn't that something? When all else... I was talking with a person this past week who is in a lot of pain. I have cancer, and some of you in here have too. My doctor told me if you had to pull a cancer out of the hat, you got the right one. It's the one we can treat. You're going to have it the rest of your life. There's no cure. But my friend pulled the wrong one. Pancreatic cancer is not one to pull out of the hat. And I don't know what the future holds. Pray every day. But what words do you say to a person when they're not getting better? And people have prayed for them, and it seems to be going a direction. And that's sometimes, this young lady has handled this in an extraordinary way. Because some of the folks that I've worked with with cancer, some of the hardest are the people who've been raised and done everything right and then everything goes wrong. You ever met those? Never smoked a day in their life and they get lung cancer, huh? How does that work? Yeah. But it's interesting to see into the life of this lady and I see the trust and commitment. She's not happy, I wouldn't be either. But she is trusting that God has a plan that's greater than our plans. Do you believe that? And I want you to see that even when this pain and heartache is racking this young lady's body, as she's seeing her children and grandchildren and realizing she may not see them grow up. I want you to know that this young lady here, in the midst of what she's in, she believes that God still exists. Do our children see that in our families? in the way we act as parents in the midst of those turns in life that we hadn't planned on. And what an opportunity in Christian education to be able to look and to study and to spend time to pray together as, as students and to face life together, what each one of these homes are facing, and to see how Christians find comfort in God when things go wrong. This young girl in the midst of her pain, whatever her parents taught her, she still believed that God still exists. I think our young people need to know that, don't you? Amen. I think it needs to be instilled to them in a young age. I want them to live long and prosper till Jesus comes. But there's no promise of what will happen. And are they learning 
that even though man's plans may succeed or fall, that God's plans for our life never fail. You have seen her story in the uh, record. She's a student at our school. She was with me on the mission trip just about uh, three weeks ago. We were in Arizona, 42 people. I had asked her specifically to come because I needed her. Her talents with music and organization, I needed someone that could help. I had builders, I needed them, but I needed this person and I was so thankful when she could come. Today, I, I, she's in San Antonio, I know. She's been part of that pathway to health. She's a nurse. We have 62 nursing students down in San Antonio today. Do you know that? And, and, and five of the professors, the whole nursing department is there participating in this pathway to health. You've read about this young lady because her story has been in the union paper. 11 years ago, while missionaries in Palau, beautiful south, uh, beautiful west Indian ocean, west uh, uh, it's in Micronesia, <laughs> West Pacific, that's where I was going. Beautiful island. An intruder breaks into their home and kills her mother, kills her father, and kills her little brother. And she survived. She and her grandparents live in our community. Her grandmother is a professor emeritus, uh, not a professor, is an adjunct professor with us right now. And I, I, you know, you, you look at this young lady and I've never seen somebody with so much joy in their life. The love they have for Jesus. I read an article about this experience where she said, I want to be educated, I want to come back here. This is where I want to live. Never met the parents, but I can see the teaching in the life of this young lady, amen? No, she's not perfect. She's like everybody else. She's a typical young person. But I see a person that still believes God exists. Amen. I see people who go through a lot less that turn their backs on God and say, why has he done this to me? Have you seen that? I want you to know that Christian education and a Christian home can instill values into your children that little do you know when you will need them, those values. That's the first one. That in the midst of controversy, God still exists. There's a second one that I see here in this passage. That's a principle, I think, for Christian education in the home and in the school as well. And that second one is this. Do you see what she says? If only my master would see the prophet. This young girl still believes that God still speaks through his word still believes that the Bible has something to say. The prophets have something to say about everyday life and where we live. Isn't that incredible? Still a believer in the Word of God. I want these young people all through their lives, regardless of what they face, to know that the Word of God still speaks to where they live and still has something to say about this life and how we live it. Do you believe that? I do. Somebody has said, well, uh, both of my daughters, by the way, were adopted. We, I got my youngest daughter when she was six months old and my oldest daughter four months later when she was four years old. And so we, we had instant family. <laughs> They're all in their 30s now. They're grown. But someone once said to me, you know, that was a great sacrifice for you and your wife to take these two children. I looked at them. You gotta be kidding me. The greater sacrifice would have been not to have these two children. Are you listening? That would have been the greater sacrifice. And you know, people talk about Christian education. It is expensive. Always will be. Monetarily. Is it a sacrifice? It is. But the greater sacrifice is not to have allowed these young people to have this kind of experience. I was recruiting for Shenandoah Valley Academy down in rural Virginia. I was in this lady's home, single parent, four boys. She was now putting the youngest one through. I had taught the other two in an academy and I was there recruiting her. She didn't need much recruitment. Working two jobs, these boys worked when they came to school 
And I was sitting at her table. We're figuring up how much it's going to cost for this last one to go through. And the two older guys walked through. She looked at me and she said, there goes my Mercedes. I said, what? She said, there goes my Mercedes. She said, what I paid for those boys' education, I could have bought myself a Mercedes. But then she said, but I get better mileage. Amen? <laughs> you get better mileage. No regret, but you get better mileage. And I do want to suggest that Christian education may be a sacrifice. But the greater sacrifice would, would to not have Christian education. When this young pastor by the name of Timothy, open your Bibles there with me if you would, to his book, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. He's in the church of Ephesus and he has got his hands full. There are major problems that he is facing that he does not have the answer to. In 2 Timothy, this is Paul writing and this is not Paul under house arrest. Paul's in chains in 2 Timothy. He knows the end is near. I mean, that's verse 7. I have fought a good fight. You've seen that, haven't you? Yes. But I want you to notice what Paul says to Timothy. He must have heard what Timothy is going through. The challenges before him. Would you notice what Paul says to Timothy? What kind of words of encouragement? He's writing from prison. Soon to die for his faith. I'd be tempted to say, Timothy, Timothy, be careful. You're going to end up where I am. I don't hear any of that. Would you notice what Paul says to Timothy? Look, if you would, in verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have what? Learned, Learned and have what? Sure. Been sure of, because you know those things whom you have learned. And how from where? Uh, how, where? Uh, Christian education. You have known the what? Holy. Holy Scriptures and how they're able to make you wise. Look what Paul says. Look at chapter 1. Chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. He's talking to Timothy in the midst of this crisis he's going through. Look what he's saying at the beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And notice if you would, uh, verse 5, he says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived where? In your grandmother Lois and in your what? Mother Eunice. Timothy, I want to tell you something. I know things are going tough. <laughs> you don't know the answers, but I want to tell you something, Timothy. I know how you were raised. I know your mom and your grandma, right? I know what they put in you as a child. You know what Paul begins to talk about now? Those scriptures you have learned, trust them now. That, isn't that what he goes on to say? Yeah, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I want to suggest that these little hymns they've sung and songs they've learned, things they're doing every day in class, trust that you don't know in life when those things will give you the hope and strength you need to get through a difficult situation. They, these are two principles you see. Number one, she's still a believer. And number two, she still believes that God's word speaks to her life and her time in which she lives. I want our young people to believe that all their life. Don't you? And there's a third thing, and we'll finish here, that I see in this young lady's life. Do you notice what she says? And I'm back again now at... Uh, uh, at 2 Kings. And notice what she says when she speaks to her maid. And uh, uh, sends this message. And says this, 2 Kings chapter 5. And she says, If only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he'd cure him of his leprosy. Listen to this. She still believes that God will act in the life of those who are unfair to you. Are you listening? That this young lady has greater love for the Lord than she has hate for her enemies. She has a greater love for the Lord than she has for a desire to get even. Oh my, if our young people could learn that, right? How many people spend their life trying to make things right and get even and angry? I'm so thankful 
I don't know what these parents taught. I, when I got here today and I was sitting in Sabbath school, I looked down and realized you forgot it. You're not at that age where you forget things yet, but some of you will get there. But uh, I walked off and left prophets and kings on my dresser. I had it. I was reading it last night, this story. And guess what? The back, you tell me God doesn't work. Here's the very passage that I was planning on reading to you from prophets and kings. You got it in your hand. There's one other sentence I'm going to add at the very beginning here when we finish. But would you notice what it says here about this little maid? You're going to take this home with you. Look at this. This is about that little maid, prophets and kings. We know not what line our children may be called to serve. They may spend their lives within the circle of the home. They may engage in life's common vocations or go as teachers or gospel workers to heathen lands. But all are alike called to be what? Missionaries to God. Ministers of mercy to the world. The sentence that I was, one sentence I was just going to add is before that. Do you know what this chapter says about that little girl? That the way she acted in this man's home is what God had called the children of Israel to do in the world. Are you listening to me? That what she did is what God had called the children of Israel to do in this world, to offer hope in the midst of pain. You see, her parents got it. Lois and Eunice got it with Timothy. You teach them the word, the presence of God. And then you believe that in the midst of your heartache and pain. Do you notice that this young girl still believed that God would act even on behalf of her enemies? That, that's an incredible heart for the Lord that's able to forgive and still believe that God loves this world as mean and rough as it can be sometimes. Teachers, teach them the word. Keep their hearts in the word. There's so many things in the world that can make you bitter and angry. I love what Paul says, and I won't go back to it in 2 Timothy. Not only does he say that he has fought a good fight and he's finished his course, but he says in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4 and verse 7, I have kept the faith. Did you hear that? I have met people who have been Christians for a long time, but because of things that happen in their life, they lose their faith and become despondent and bitter and disappointed. I don't know about you, but I want to be a believer till Jesus comes. Amen? Anybody else here? I don't care what happens in this world. I want to believe that God still exists. That his word still speaks to where we live. And even in the midst of what we're going through, I want to pray for those who don't know him yet and believe that God can still make a difference in their hearts. I want to tell you, that comes from Christian education. It didn't come from my home. I love my mom. She died just a few years ago, but it was a different life. I, I, I didn't grow up as a to having his parents drinking and all that stuff going on. Kids were getting under bed so we don't get hit, you know, that type of thing. My mother's married to a couple men and lived with several more. I love her dearly. She just never made good decisions about men. When I, uh, when she, when I was 13 years old, she had separated from my stepfather. My stepfather, he was a, an army guy in World War II, big, tall fella, also a drunk. That's not a good combination later in life. And he was quite, abus quite abusive to us as kids. We lived out on a farm. I thought everybody got smacked upside the head. Maybe some of you did, or hit with stuff, you know, when you do something wrong. That, but I'm not talking about spanking on the bottom. I'm just talking about a drunk swinging for you and sometimes connecting. So I just sort of thought everybody was raised that way. My mother separated from this man. And during that time, a Seventh-day Adventist minister had visited her. A neighbor had submitted her name. I don't know how it happened. But this man visits my mom and studies the Bible with her. And she gets baptized. And there's five of us kids. I'm the oldest of five. And my mother remains a Seventh-day Adventist for all of about three months. And during that time, in between my eighth and ninth grade year, I'm going to South Charleston Junior High in South Charleston, West Virginia. 
During that time, someone says, my mother gets separated. She has five kids moving off the farm into the city, got to find work, got to support these kids. Someone said, that oldest kid of yours, that tall, redheaded, skinny, you, 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 <laughs> trust me, skinny, that uh, he's going to run the streets. You need to put him in an academy. And so they did. They put me in Mount Vernon Academy, 1967. I, I thought I'd die and gone to the moon. I've told some of you that before. I'm from West Virginia. First of all, they didn't eat squirrel there. You know, it was just a, a different place for me from where I was used to. And not only that, I told you they talked about Ellen White. I thought she lived in the community. I had no idea. <laughs> they sent me to the cafeteria to get my first job in 1967. And the director of the cafeteria, what's her name? Wava White. I thought, that's her. That's Mrs. White, always talking about food, runs the cafeteria here, you know? <laughs> and so I know nothing. I get up there and I'm there about well, two home leaves. I'm there uh, the month. That's when they used to have home leaves about once a month. And on the second home, I would come home, I'd go to my grandparents. My mother was working. The other kids were farmed out to aunts and uncles. But the second time I come home, and I have, I mean, this academy has been wonderful. I have made friends. I love sports. I'm doing that and not studying as much as I should. But it has become home for me to come from such a dysfunctional family. First time I'd ever seen worship, you know, and, and this type of thing going on. And you just can't imagine what that was doing to my soul. And I'm home on the second home leave. We're getting ready to leave the next day to go back. There were a lot of parents that had kids there from the church I was at. So they would take turns carpooling, you know, taking everybody back. We'd meet at a location. Parents, we'd all get in the two or three cars and go back. I get a call from my mother night before and she says I'm going back with your stepfather you need to come home that's enough of that foolishness you need to come home I didn't want to go home <laughs> she's a 13 year old skinny kid and I love my mother didn't couldn't say that for my stepfather though he did teach me how to work and be polite or get smacked you know type thing so there's some things I learned but I didn't want to go home and I'm with my grandparents who are not Seventh-day Adventists, but they see what this school has done to my life in two months. They want me going back. They want me going back. And so the next morning, we load up the car. We go to the designated spot. And I got my little suitcase. I'm going back for home leave. And we pull up. And we're there. And all the parents are pulling in. And I see my mother pull up with the stepfather in his car. They're there to get me. <laughs> And I remember sitting in this car, and I, I don't know what to do. I'm just this little 13-year-old kid. This is a man. This, this is an army man. I mean, this is one tough dude. And I'm just this little 13-year-old kid, and I'm sitting there in my grandparents' car. They don't know what to do either. They know he can be violent. And we're sitting there. And everybody's coming. They're loading up the cars, and I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, the door opens. And standing beside me is a gentleman named Mr. Hayes, Bob Hayes, I'll never forget it. He had on one of those khaki, you know, khaki shirts, khaki pants. He worked at a assembly line or some kind of factory or something, had his name on it, he's standing there. Man reached down and got my suitcase and he said, Bill, it's time to go. And took my suitcase in one hand and me in the other and put me in his car. I, I never saw my stepfather again. I saw my mother. She didn't stay with him long. It busted up again. But I want to tell you something. This man, I don't know, I think he was over six feet. He looked seven feet tall to me at the moment. <laughs> when he came and opened that door and said, Bill, it's time to go. I realized that God had sent, I realized now I didn't know them, but God had sent an angel that has changed my life. I don't know what would have happened. But I want to tell you something. Big doors turn on small hinges. That person stood up for me when I couldn't stand for myself. Kept me in Christian education. Who knows where I'd be today? I love my family. We've always had problems with alcoholism and everything else. And I would have been the same. I was stealing cigarettes at 11, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I want to tell you something as I finish here. These principles, looking at these children. I want them to believe that God exists and 
He has something to say for the time they're living. And he loves those, even those who are unlovable. God still loves them. But I want you to know something. And I want to say thank you to this church. To see what you have, these 38 students. You all are making sacrifices. I know that. Parents are, and church members here are making sacrifices. For this school to happen, it does not just happen. I know that. But I want to thank you for what you're doing. But there may be somebody here that knows a young person that needs to be in this school for next year. And I know, I mean, my mother, five kids, divorced, no job. What a mess. Who in the world would have ever thought that anything could ever happen here for that situation? But that man got out of that car, <laughs> took me by the hand. Small hinges control big doors and my appeal to you today is that there may be somebody here today that you know a young person that needs to be here and I know that it looks impossible like it could never happen I mean I was the last person you'd ever want your son to room with in the dorm <laughs> I didn't have that kind of background but let me tell you whenever those other parents came up and got their kids and took them out to eat I always got to go along. Isn't that amazing? I saw how a husband should treat his wife when I went home with my roommate and saw him have morning and evening. I'd never seen that before in my life. There's some of you here. And I'm just going to pray. I'm finished here. But I'm just going to pray that if God puts it on your heart that there's a young people, a young person that needs to join this group, I know it's a sacrifice already for everyone to do what you're doing. But there may be somebody here that knows of someone that needs to be here. And God needs you to stand up for that. Open the door. Take them by the hand. Put them there. Little do you know how you're affecting them for eternity. You know that? Bob has died. I, I saw his wife at a camp meeting I was doing in Florida a few years ago. She came up to me. I hadn't seen her in 30, 40 years. And I, we talked about this story and just cried. I said, he's the first one I'm going to hug in heaven. <laughs> the difference that event made in my life. You don't know the difference. What you can do in the life of a young people can shape them forever. That little girl in scripture changed the course of history. Do you know that? And we don't even know her name. I pray for you in this church that you continue to do that with these young people. Teachers, that you continue instilling the word of God and the love of God in the hearts of these young. You don't know what the future holds. None of us do, do we? But I know who holds it. Amen?